Hi, and welcome to Charity Questions from the Directory of Social Change. So Charity Questions is a podcast where we sit down monthly with people from the charity sector and ask them questions about their careers and their lives and what that means to them in the, in the charity sector. And our first guest today is none other than Deborah Alcock-Tyler, the CEO of Directory of Social Change. Hi, Deborah. Great. So what we're talking to Deborah about today, we're talking about Deborah's career and the life of Deborah Alcock-Tyler. For those of you that do not know her career up to this point, this is going to be an opportunity for a deep dive into that. And we've already put this out to social media and we've asked some questions to the group and we'll be bringing those to this podcast today and we've also asked some questions from the DSC team so this is our time to talk to Deborah and learn some more about her career and and I know bits and bobs so uh, my name's George George Knight I'm one of the trainers at DSC and I've been here for four years but now is my time to learn a little bit more about Deborah as well and, and dig deeper into some of those stories so I'm really excited to have her here today so welcome Deborah. Hello George. <laughs> Thank you. There's one that's like always mortifying when somebody says, can you please tell me about your career? And you think, oh, dear. Firstly, I've got to try and remember. <laughs> and secondly, I'm never sure it's that interesting. But anyway, take it away, my darling. Anything you want to ask is fine. Perfect. Great. So we'll start with just some questions from, from the DSC team then. And so what, what they wanted to know, they just wanted you to talk about your current role at DSC and just tell us how long you've been with the charity. Sure. So I'm the Chief Exec at Director of Social Change, and I've been Chief Executive for 20 years in, in a couple of months' time, actually, in August, I'll have been in 20 years. I never thought I'd be here for 20 years, actually. Um, the time has just literally gone past, and I can't believe it. Um, I love it. The thing for me is, is that it doesn't feel like a job or like work, really. Mm. I honestly feel like I found my vocation when I landed up in this organisation. You know, I'm passionate about the work of charities. I'm passionate about the impact that they have. I'm very poor at frontline stuff. You know, I, I just don't have the mental or emotional resilience to deal you know, myself with myself with people who are suffering Absolutely. or, you know, Absolutely. and it doesn't matter if it's animals or people or anything like that. I just I just don't have that resilience. I don't, don't have that skill set or that ability, really, which is one of the reasons why I'm absolutely in awe of people on the front line who are engaging and delivering services, because I, you know, that's just, I, I, I think it's incredible. What I am pretty good at is things like governance and leadership and that sort of thing. So I'm much better at supporting people who do that kind of work. And of course, that's what's so perfect about DSC, you know, is that we as an organisation, we spend all of our time trying to help charities to be the best they can possibly be so that the world gets better. And like, what's not to love about that? So yeah, I absolutely love it here. And we've, and we've changed so much actually over the last, well, since inception, you know, DSC's, I know what, something like 45 plus years old. Um, yeah. You know, even in the last, even in 45 years, we've changed a lot from when we started out from when Michael Norton, our founder, began the organisation, supported by obviously Luke Fitzherbert, who's very precious, um, sold to us. Um, but then it's changed a lot in the last 20 years too, you know, so even though fundamentally what we're doing, the support that we're offering is still the same. The ways in which we deliver that support, the content, the things that we say, you know, they've all become very, very different over time. So it's never, ever felt like it's the same organisation, to be honest, year on year on year. Yeah, I can feel that even in, even in my, my short time, definitely. And, and, and the slogan is helping you to help others. And, and that sounds like the role we play, isn't it? And uh, it can be easier for us a, a step away from, from the, from yeah. the beneficiaries, can't it? And we have to remember that sometimes. And, and actually, that's why, why we volunteer. And, uh, and I know that you're, you're interested in volunteering. Um, and so you volunteer with Berkshire Community Foundation. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So Berkshire Community, Community Foundation is, is one of the network of community foundations across the UK. There's about 50 of them all together under the, the um, umbrella ship of the United King, the UKCF, which is United Kingdom Community Foundations Network, basically. Um, community foundations are incredibly important organisations, so they're very focused on typically the county that they're actually in. And what they do is they... They um, collect money effectively from like local businesses and the philanthropists and, you know, high net worth individuals and in some cases, smaller communities and redistribute that money to charities within that particular county, within that particular community, within that particular area. And so what they do is they kind of make the connections within the geographical boundaries, which, as I said, is typically counties so that small charities in those counties are supported by people in the counties. They're so I mean, they're very different ways in which they it's all slightly structured, slightly differently and they, they have slightly different focuses depending on you know the, the area in which they live but they're like I, I, I think of you know the community foundations generally is like a central hub 
in the community. They're very often supported mm -hmm. by the Lord and Lieutenant and the High Sheriffs of those particular counties. Very often the major business people in the area and stuff like that and absolutely reach out to local charities. So there's a lot of work that couldn't happen in small charities in those places if it wasn't for community foundations. And of course, Berkshire just happens to be the county in which I live, which absolutely. is why that's one of the ones that I, you know, so that's my way of feeling that like I'm contributing locally. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, as well as, because DSE has a very national role, obviously, and so does In Kind Direct, which is the other charity that I'm a trustee of, whereas yeah. Berkshire Community Foundation is very much about Berkshire, which is where I live. So I straddle the two, you know, the local and the national. So you're involved with, with these three charities at a really high level. Is there any, when you look back to kind of your early life or even your career before DSC, were there any major milestones you think that influenced your kind of journey to this point? Um, it's probably loads, George, honestly. I mean, it's really difficult to say. I come from a family of, of servers, you know. My, the, so my, fam my family background is either military or... You know, my cousin is a, a lawyer, for example. Mm. My sister works for the NHS. My brother's served in the military. You know, so, so my whole kind of family ethos and background is about serving others in some way, shape or form, some form of public service, really. So I guess I just kind of always had that surrounding me. You know, my father used to do lots of fundraising for charities when he was in the military and stuff like that. So I've always been attracted by this notion of, you know, giving basically that the, the idea is that you're there to serve others not serve yourself and so yeah so I just think that kind of general thing but I'm all, I was also very lucky in that after like one or two forays into slightly weird jobs um, in the private sector I ended up working for an organization called the Industrial Society which had it doesn't exist anymore sadly but it had the profoundest effect on my life and that of many others because this was an organization that that had a campaigning objective which is about improving working life for people in this country and, and abroad of course but primarily yeah. in this country it was itself a registered charity um with a as i said very strong campaigning ethos but what it, most of the work that it did it did with the private sector with companies because it was about helping companies to like teach like communicate better with their staff about supporting trade unions and that kind of thing yeah. and so i got this real sense of service from that mm. really and i think that's carried me into this sort of love for the voluntary sector generally so although it was a charity most of the work I did was with the private sector you know I trained directors and managing directors and you know of, of private sector companies um, but my heart was always in just that it was about this campaigning organization that was trying to make the world of work a better place so you know and it's like you get hooked on that feeling that feeling that you're actually doing something massive to change the world so I understand yeah. that feeling you're right you do get hooked yeah. And I, and I was familiar with the Industrial Society actually before I, I joined DSC and it was one of the reasons why actually I, I was able to join DSC because I was uh, worked with somebody in the, in the last organisation uh, who was also a, a graduate of the Industrial Society. Oh really? Who was that? It was Gail Toucher. Gail Toucher. Oh goodness me, yes of course. Yeah, yes, Gail's I remember Gail. Yeah, QM, yeah. Yes. Oh how lovely, yes. And I think you can yes, see those values. Absolutely. You can see those values actually going into, into DSC. And did you try and do that actively? Did you think I'm going to take some of what I've learned here? And Very bring? much so. There yep. was, I mean, there were, don't get me wrong, there were some horrible things, you know, because bearing in mind, I started my career in the 80s. And although the Industrial Society was ahead of its time yeah. in terms of the way in which it, you know, it communicated and briefed and engaged and all the rest of it. Also, it was, you know, there was quite a lot of sexism and, you know, so it's quite a challenging place to work in, in some ways too. Um, although much better, we had loads of female leaders as role models actually which was quite which is also really helpful people like julia cleverton for example dame julia cleverton yeah. who many listeners to this will have come across or have heard yeah. of you know ex chief exec business in the community um you know uh, uh, teach first campaign and so forth yeah um, and i've completely forgotten the question already george so we were saying um Industrial society. So talking about how you brought the industrial values. society values into DSC. Yeah, absolutely. So, but it really, really focused on leadership and what leadership means. And we all of us got mm. so much training in how to communicate, how to lead and all the rest of it, how to structure your organisation fairly. And of course, I was a, um, a, a massive trade union supporter. So I was a trade union officer for 14 years within the industrial society. So I was very much about employee representation. I mean, I'm, I was also, I was trying to bring a union into DSC, but the staff don't want a union. And that's why you <laughs> that I insist upon the forum you must have a staff forum it's really important oh, to have yeah. representation yeah exactly yeah. so I'm also all of that stuff just stood me in really good stead for understanding about how to 
work with people how to structure organizations so that's why for example at dsc as you know george we have very very strict protocols we have you know everybody's briefed at least once a month at the same time by their line manager about what's going on in the organization we tell the truth we tell people about the finances and the challenges and the difficulties and things like that but you know we have these regular meetings we have consultations we have staff forms and things like that and all of that stuff i learned during my time at the industrial society which I've carried through to DSC I like to think actually in some ways we do things better here because obviously I, the industrial society was over 20 years ago and things yeah. the world has changed and evolved since then so I think I think we didn't just take what was good about the industrial society we've improved it absolutely yeah yeah. And, I'm sure, and I'm sure you're right. We are on a, on a path towards becoming better. And I think if we have the same conversation in 20 years time, we'd probably say yeah. actually we've improved upon DSC and then maybe what we've got here at the moment, which is already so good. Yeah. So taking it back to this military uh, childhood, then I'm really interested in that and uh, how that sort of lifestyle maybe impacted you as a child or as a young, young adult. Uh, and am I right in thinking you grew up on a, on a military base at times? Well, military well, bases. Base 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 bases, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So between, so up until about the age of 18, I think we lived in something like 20 different houses. You know, yeah, because you, you, you check, because my father was from a, a part of the army. He was in the REMI, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. And that's a part of the army that goes to all different regiments. Other regiments all move together. But yeah. in the REMI, you move independently. And so you never created any, there was no, you didn't get to know anybody. You, you, mm. you every, every year or every couple of years, you had to completely dump your friends and your school and move into a new place and start all over again, which is a very, very difficult way to live a life, actually, especially as a child. Um, because the military understood that. So, for example, in my younger years, I lived in Germany, I live in Hong Kong, I live in Malaya. Wow. You know, we moved all around, sometimes in the UK, back and forth. So I, so I never really felt I belonged anywhere because mm. we never were anywhere. You know, you didn't. Build, there's no sense of local community at all in that mm. way. But what the military does is that where children's um, education is massively disruptive, disrupted because of the nature of military life, um, they give an allowance for you to be able to be sent to a stable school, which is a boarding school. So me, both my brothers and my sister all got sent away to boarding school. Um, in fact, I, I had to go from to boarding school from Hong Kong. So I was, what, 12 years old, something like that, 12, 13 years old. And I had to get on an airplane all by myself and fly all those thousands of miles away from my family and my home to go to this boarding school. Oh um, yeah, exactly. So, but it wasn't, um, yeah, so I had, a, I, I had a boarding school education. Although, interesting, my boarding school was a state boarding school, mm-hmm. which I don't think they exist anymore, but a state boarding school. So it wasn't like a private school in that sense. It was one that... Um, people, so you did have to pay to go there. The army had to pay except fees, but it was somewhere that was open to anybody from any caliber. So we, you know, you would have people coming to our boarding school who had been plucked out of, you know, bad situations, yeah. you know, yeah. certain communities like that. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't private in the same sort. Of, it wasn't independent school in the same way that some are. Um, yeah. So that and that was a very formative experience because you're away from your parents. I mean, I personally. Although I made some very strong friends at school, and I wouldn't say I was treated badly, I hated it. Mm. Mm. No, I would much rather have been with my parents and, and that sort of thing. So I don't blame them for sending me at all. You know, they did what they thought was the right thing for my education. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't really. You know, I, I, I'm not convinced by the boarding school system, even though I understand why my parents did that. Um, I'm sorry, I got completely reminisced thinking back about being at boarding school. I've completely forgotten the question now. Oh, good. We're just talking about, uh, yeah, just anything that may oh, be... Oh, military life. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Influence, yeah. So, so one of the things you learn when you live that kind of life as a child is you have to learn very, very quickly to be self-reliant. Mm. If, you can't get, if you get too attached to people, you get ripped away from them, mm. you know, very fast. So you learn to become self-reliant. You also learn, like, how to get on very quickly with a whole load of strangers so you learn a lot of those sort of immediate social skills because you don't have time to build relationships. It's got to be quick and immediate and things like that. Yeah. You also learn how to deal with people from very different sections of society because, you know, in the military, you're as likely to come across the colonel as you are a corporal. And um, you have to be able to engage, you know, yeah, with people. Yeah. Right? So they're not being intimidated by certain people because they have to have a certain rank and things like that so you do you earn a lot of independence a lot of social skills typically or at least I think I did yeah. and I expect my brothers and sisters that sister the same 
you've said you said three things you said self-reliance getting on with strangers and being able to talk to people from from different levels of uh, community yeah. and society yeah. those sound like they go hand to hand with what you're doing right now almost in your in your job do you feel that yeah oh yes definitely absolutely for sure yeah a lot of the skills I got from being a military child I'm sure helped me in my current work mm, absolutely where was the favorite place you lived on Alan Street the favorite place um, well, I don't really remember my leg because I was a very little girl and bits of Germany, I remember, but, I, but Hong Kong, I would say, I mean, Hong Kong was a wonderful place to live and we were there for almost three years, I think, it was one of the longest postings my father had actually, from memory, although that is also where I got sent to boarding school from, but it's like the weather and the heat and the freedom and the, you know, mm-hmm. and we were afraid in those days. I mean, I, you know, I, at 10, 11 years old, I'd be wandering off down to the local market with my friends, you know, it's on awesome. my own. Yeah, it was, a, and swimming, of course. It's like, you know, if you learned very, very quickly how to swim, because if you couldn't swim, you didn't have any mates. Uh, so we're all, we're all really good swimmers in our family because uh, of that time in Hong Kong, you know, you had to learn fast. So it was just, yeah, it was warm. It was free. It was... Yeah, absolutely great fun. And, and like experiencing the culture and the difference. I mean, I have to say, however, you, you don't, in those days, I, I'd like to think it's better and different now, but in those days you didn't integrate at all okay. with the local population. But of course, you got to know, you know, you got to know people, but you didn't really, it was very much kept. And looking back now, it's very colonial, actually, way of engaging, because of course, Hong Kong is a colony. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I kind of experienced what that felt like. So looking back now, some of that feels uncomfortable. But at the time, I just felt free, you know, running right. around. Yeah. Would you would you want to move back to any of these places now in, in your life at the moment? No, I don't think so. I mean, they've all, you know, you have your memories of your past. I always remember when I was growing up, my grandmother had this massive table um, that she, I think she bought with her from India. She, my grandmother's mixed race Anglo-Indian, as, as I think you know, Georgia, though many um, listeners probably won't. Anyway, she brought this, this massive, like, hexagon table back. And I remember as a little girl, this table felt absolutely huge. Mm. And then, of course, visiting my grandmother as an adult, it wasn't really as big as I remember it. You know, and I think that's something like that's about when you go back to the places of your youth. You that's know, they're not quite as you remember them. And, yeah, so oh, no. Nice. Yeah, that's true. Perfect. Um, so when we think back to your career, then obviously the industrial society and, and the military childhood, was there any single moment where you thought, I, I want to be a leader, actually, I want to lead people, I think I've got this? I, always. I don't remember a time when I wasn't the boss. I mean, I'm the eldest of my of my um, siblings. I'm the eldest female grandchild of, on my um, okay. both sides, actually. So although um, my cousin Vincent is older than me, he's a year older than me, then it's me, and then it's all the other, you know, 13, 14, or however many years others that there are. But I was always the eldest. So I'm always the eldest, always given responsibility, always, can you keep an eye on your sister? Can you keep an eye on your brother? You know, that kind of thing. So basically, I learned very early on that I was in charge of stuff. Although my, my mother is very funny. She says, you know, you weren't born a leader, darling. You were born bossy. They're not the same thing. <laughs> and there's an element to that because I'm very bossy, George, as you know. I mean, I try not to be, but I can't help it. Years of years of training. So, yeah, I think I've always, always. So I, it's not that I ever wanted to be. It just never occurred to me that I wouldn't because I was in charge of my brothers and sisters. You know, I was very often like put in charge of stuff at school. So, yeah, it just never. So I couldn't say I ever sort of like I want to be a leader. It's just like I, I just instinctively. Like, you know, happened. Yeah, just kind of take over and start organizing and managing and things like that. So, yeah. And I, and I do see it lends itself to your skill and your natural skill set. Absolutely being being a leader there. And as someone who is the youngest of in his siblings and also the youngest uh, in his among his cousins, I can definitely feel that it took me a lot longer to grow up. So I can imagine that that being the oldest one, it definitely does kind of bring you up to that level a little bit earlier, doesn't it? Yeah. So, um, oh, it's having a little thing now. Just a little pause, a little look at the question. So we've had a little look at. Um, single moment in your career so now we're moving on to stuff about like overcoming any difficulties overcoming challenges is that okay yes of course great um so can you give us an idea of something significant that you've overcome in either your home life or your career um gosh so career-wise being a woman and being a woman trying to get into the leadership field I remember when I first wanted to start training in leadership 
And I was actively discouraged from doing that because I was young and I was a woman and they said I wouldn't have the credibility. And at the Industrial Society, you had to learn. There was a particular leadership program called Action Centered Leadership, which was developed by a chap called John Adair um, out of Santos. And, and I actually use lots of those principles today, build the team, develop individuals, achieve the task. Yeah. But you, ha- you weren't allowed to deliver that training without being properly accredited. You know, you actually had to, it was quite an intensive learning process. And I was desperate to like learn how to be an action center centered leadership tutor and I kept being told I couldn't do it because Mm -hmm. you know I was a woman I'd be training loads of men you know the the only people who are credible to these people people who've done the job and all the rest of it and that so that was real real frustration and I was the only woman in a team of all men Mm. and I'm the first woman in that team of all men and you know that was a that was a really tough time because I was constantly having to prove myself constantly having to overcome you know, sort of prejudice. And I, and I I remember at one point, there was a point at which actually when I wanted to become this trainer in the first place, and um, I went to one of the directors and I said, look, I want to become a management advisor, which is what we called them. Yeah. And I remember him saying to me, and I want to become a management advisor in leadership um, development and training. And I remember him saying to me, Firstly, well, why do you want to stop being, because I was a, a, a business unit manager effectively, but like a PAAO manager, a bit like, you know, we have a, a DSC. Yeah. And um, and he said, well, why are you going for a different job anyway? You're really good at the job you do. Why don't you stay doing it? <laughs> you know, you wouldn't say that if it was a bloke, actually. But then I said, I said to this particular director, well, why didn't you stay you know, when you were a clerk, you're now a director. Why didn't you stay being a clerk? Because presumably you're a really good clerk. And actually, to his credit, he said, okay, fair point. And then he, <laughs> said, but then he said, okay, but okay, you can become this management trainer, but you need to do it in secretarial development or comm skills. Mm. Because that's what, we, and, I, and again, so I really had to fight for my place, you know, to be able to go into this, um, this particular thing. And even then, the, the barriers that were set up, like, you know, I was the only one who didn't have a company car, for example. You know, just it, I look back at it now and it, it was quite exhausting at the time, but I didn't give up. You know, share it's, that, I was going to say, share that question again. What did, you, what did you ask him? What did you ask this gentleman? What was the question you said then? When, you, when uh, he said to you, you, you were really good at your PA role. I said, why didn't you stay at the level? Didn't you know, you know why didn't you stay at the clerk or whatever the, his job was? You know, because very few people go straight into directorships. Most people, you know, start somewhere. You know, why didn't you just stay at a clerk? level and of course you know because he was ambitious what made you say that that's such a great question just the innate unfairness of it you know like because I kind of like put myself in his shoes well I want to be promoted because I want to grow and develop and have more senior roles and so did you so what's the difference really so yeah yeah I don't know I'm a quick thinker George it is one of my skills actually I am very very quick Absolutely. And it is in the questioning sometimes that we help people to think differently. And, and, I, and I really yeah. like that. Is, is that a kind of questioning? Is that a learned skill? Or yeah. um, I think you get taught it, to be honest. I don't think I've always been very good. I'm not even sure I'm always that good today at, at sort of questioning. But then the other, and then the other, I mean, I remember years and years and years ago when I was very young and I first started out in my career and I worked for a small a charity that was attached to a major international bank. And the director of the charity was, he was so sexually harassing. Like he was, uh, like he would hug you and press your, you know, do that boob squishy thing that some men do, which is just so gross. And um, like behave really inappropriately. And it was awful. It was such an intimidating environment. And I remember, and it, this, this was a bank in the city that employed thousands and thousands of people. And I can remember, and it, but this guy was really, really senior. He was incredibly important. He was... You know, he was a scientific advisor to the United Nations. He was somebody really respected. And, you know, and anyway, I remember going to the personnel director and complaining, you know, and saying, look, you know, this, I, I feel intimidated and I'm being harassed, sexually harassed by this man. And I remember the personnel director saying, well, tough, basically, you know, and also because he was quite old, he was in his 70s, which is not that old in fairness, but at the time when I was 20, that felt really old. And they said, well, he's an old man, you know, can you not just wave it off or awful and actually it's because of that I couldn't stay because it was just like I just wasn't being protected or supported and I was being sexually harassed in my workplace it was awful I ended up leaving but then I that's how I ended up at the industrial society ironically so in fact I look back now and although it was an awful experience and made me I was frightened to go to work you know and not only that 
it was worse than that. It's because they knew, the rest of my colleagues in that quite small team knew that this man was harassing me. They blamed me. Like I was, it was like, it wasn't, I wasn't the victim here. It was, oh, it was just horrible. Yeah, but I, it's because of that that I ended up in industrial society. So I think, you know, when you look back at sort of things that have happened to you in your life, the really good and the really bad, mm. the reality is they are just the things that happen to you to get you to where you need to go. I mean, I say this to people about when they don't get jobs that they want. You know, every single one of the jobs that I didn't get got me to the job that I did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I'd have got those jobs, I wouldn't have ended up where I am now at DSC, where I'm really, really happy and I love my work and I love my team and, you know, it feels what we're doing is valuable and important. So, you know, that you, it's sort of, it's not saying you should look back on really shit things that have happened in your life and think they're okay, because they're not. When bad things happen, that's not okay. But it's not to let those things cripple you so that you're unable to move forward. Yeah. You know, it's to say, okay, I'm gonna, that happened to me and I survived it, actually. Well done me. And now I'm going to, you know, take what I learned and, yeah. And can we use them now to learn from yeah. those and then make sure nobody else get, feels yeah. the way I felt? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and so I, I, I do think that's partly where my sense of social justice comes from. Mm. It's like in those early days, having to face that sexual harassment, that discrimination, that mm. you know, it's just that's just not fair, and I just it's not fair, and I won't have it, you know. And I think that's why I was so interested in trade unions, you know, and yeah, and social justice really. Yeah, uh, and that sounds like a, a, a massive challenge in your career, and you handled that really well. And I and I can't imagine you're facing anything quite like that at the moment on a personal level. But but are there any challenges that you're facing at, at direction of social change in your career that you wouldn't mind sharing with listeners today? Um, gosh, I mean, I think the challenges we're facing as a sector more than I feel very accountable for. I think DSC, we have an incredibly strong team at DSC. We have really competent, capable people and we trust them largely. So I generally don't really worry about DSC because I, and also because we've had, as you know, George, we've been through some really, really tough times at DSC when we've had barely any money. We've not known whether we're going to be able to pay the salaries from one day to the next, or it's felt like it anyway. And so we've faced, and we've had some, you know, some issues with staff and we've had all sorts, we've faced the same things that most organisations face, but our staff are so grown up and adult and engaged and, you know that I never really worry about DSC particularly I don't think I mean I'll, you know at the beginning of pandemic obviously I did awesome. but I never worry about our ability to deal with whatever it is that we face really but I do worry more about the sector as a whole mm. I think that, you know we're in a time of hyper activism and you know it's like and you're being watched constantly and people are waiting for you to make mistakes and jump on you and and rightly so, actually, because there's a lot of stuff we have not got right and that we need to be ashamed of. But it is quite exhausting when you're leading an organisation where you're being constantly attacked and told you're not good enough, you're not getting it right, you're racist or sexist or, you know, and those things can be, you know, well, it's making quite a lot of chief execs ill. And mm. very often mm. it's the, 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 the things they're being attacked for are things that are endemic in society and that have been reflected in their own organisations. It's not that they actively set out for those things to happen. Not that I'm making excuses, you know, because it's, it's our job as chief executives and leaders in the sector to be aware and to make and to perform ourselves and educate ourselves, you know, so I, I'm not making excuses, but it is really, really difficult. I mean, being a chief executive is a pretty tough job at the best of times because it is pretty lonely. You don't belong to anybody, you see. You're not part of the board. Mm. You know, and they're a team of people who have each other as peers. You're not part of your leadership team or your organisation because they've all got peers. So you don't have anybody at all anywhere. That it's ju- literally, it's the only job that's just you on your own. And that can be incredibly stressful and lonely at the best of times. It's even mm. worse when you're held accountable. Mm. Actually, you know, and I have to say, some of this stuff that's going on in the sector around, you know, issues around race and sexual harassment and things like that, you know, I, I'm, I'm disappointed by how many organisations, boards are hiding behind their chief executives and actually not coming out. I mean, some are, don't get me wrong, some are dealing with these things better than others. But... You, I think as, when you're a trustee, you can't run and hide. It's not okay mm-hmm. to jump all on the chief executive. It's not okay to say, well, we didn't know as a board. Yeah. You know, it's all the chief executive and the leadership team who are responsible for this horrible environment. Because, no, you're the board. You're accountable. You know, you weren't asking the right questions. You're not, you know. So, yeah, I completely got distracted there. I've no idea. My mind went off in a whatever. But, you know, I, so I don't worry about DSC, but I do worry about what's going on in the sector. But I also think, like, get on the front foot with it all. 
Yeah. You know, the reality is, is that, of course, there are problems in our organisations because we're part of society and there are problems in society. So it's not being naive. I mean, I think I will say that's one thing I'm really proud of with us at DSC, George, is that we don't, we've always been ahead of the game. So we started looking at these issues around race and diversity, what, three, four years ago, probably? Yeah. Maybe even a little bit before. Yeah, exactly. Long before it became sort of, you know, the zeitgeist of the moment. Oh, it's yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. And so it's like, so don't don't be complacent. Don't think just because you think you're a good person that there aren't issues going on in your organisation. Of course there are, because it's society. So, and, and okay, there's, we obviously need to work to change systems and things like that in society, but we can start with our own organisations as soon as a problem and go and fix it, you know? Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the worry at the moment, I think. And you mentioned they're kind of feeling isolated in the role of CEO. And I think you sum that perfectly. You are in this middle stage between the trust yeah. and, and then the wider team. Um, I, one thing I've personally learned from you, Deborah, is, is the way you network with like-minded colleagues and other people in the role. And I know that you've encouraged people in DSC to do the same thing. Um, and so do, what do you get from the other CEOs in the charity sector? Oh, that sense of not being on your own. Yeah. You know, whatever I'm facing, absolutely down to any one of my fellow chief executives is facing something way worse, you know, <laughs> and that, you know, yeah, so it's like, so you do get, God, it's really shit, isn't it? Why we, why did we ever agree to do these jobs? So you just get that sense of reassurance that none of these problems are unique, mm. none of them are special to you, you know, and that if you're messing it up or getting it wrong, so is everybody else. You know, you, you, you don't have a, you, you know, you're not specially gifted in the failure <laughs> realm you know is everybody else is fading their front and center as well and it's all right so yeah lots of but also I'm just really interested in other people anyway I just you know of all sorts of walks of life so my my networks are much wider than chief executives and I've got lots of people who aren't they're at different levels in the organization so yeah what role do you think a network has played in your career um well learning really because when you listen to other people you learn you know, about different perspectives and different backgrounds and how people approach things differently and how they see things differently to the way you do. You know, and I think that, because as you know, I'm an avid, I, I, I like to know stuff, George. I'm a know-it-all. And I want, and I, it's not, I don't like it if people know things I don't. So I need to go and find out those things, if you know what I mean. It's like, yeah. And so, and I think that just like having that being curious about how the world works and in every aspect you know it's like for example I don't really read self-help books the sort I read like loads of books on physics and economics and psychology and philosophy and things like that so all of those things are not necessarily directly related to my work as a leader or at DSC but like there, there are things that you can you know create you can create sort of metaphors and analogies between the things you've learned so for example in physics there's a thing called action at a distance and that's basically about when you separate two particles that are, that are together by infinite amount if you change the spin on one it changes the spin on other on the other but that's completely like physics can't explain that because nothing travels faster than the speed of light oh, and these things happen these things happen instantaneously anyway like learning about that just made me think about the connectivity between human beings and how you know the kind of conversations I have with you George are going to have an impact on, on how you engage with other people and how you approach your day and it's not even necessarily that you will say to anybody Deborah said this but that your thinking will have moved and emerged and changed such that you won't even necessarily know that mm. something you say to somebody as a result of a conversation that you and I had. So I'm very conscious about the value of the importance of, you know, that you nothing you do is on its own, if you see what I mean. It's always going to influence something else. And that thought came to me because of reading that. about the, you know, the spin on the particles. Can you can you say what that was again? That physics theory. That what what is that again? It's called action. So basically, so I mean, I can't. I'm not going to the details of it. What I'll is get it. The name, and then people can research it if they want to learn more. So, so it's basically the spin on the particles. You've got two partic uh, particles that are like twinned, effectively. If you separate them, they match in spin, okay? But if you change the spin on one and they're separated by infinity, it changes the spin on the other, like instantaneously, exactly the same time. So there's, you know, the basic laws of physics, there's no rules that, you know, there's, there's they physically can't have communicated with each other because, you know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, as far as we know. I mean, you know, things change, of course. As far as we know, yes, exactly. So it's absolutely fascinating. So it's the spin on separated particles. Amazing. It's, called act, it's called spooky action at a distance. And I think that was a coin termed by Einstein, if I'm right. Spooky action at a distance. Or maybe Richard Feynman, I'm not sure. 
Anyway, it's cool. Yeah. So if, if, we, if listeners want to find out about it, Google spooky action at a distance and explain to you about these, the separation of these particles and the spin. Amazing. And actually, when you learn these difficult topics, it actually helps your brain to become a learner as well and then teaches you how yeah. to learn, which is really helpful. Yeah. So what would staff at DSC say about you then as a CEO? What, how, what would they describe you as, Deborah? Well, I can tell you because, as you know, George, we do 360-degree feedback at DSC, and we do it in such a way that staff are able to be relatively open and honest. So I think what they, so I think our staff generally find me, I think they're quite proud of the fact that we're, I'm so engaged and so like interested in things and talk about stuff. I think that they would say I'm brave yeah. because I'm not afraid to say things. I, they would say I'm impatient, which is very true. You know, I, I'm not very good at waiting for things to happen. They say that I have a tendency to interrupt people, not not because I'm bored and not listening to them, because I'm so excited and engaged in the conversation. I cut over people and I assume I know what they're going to say. So they would absolutely say that. I think they would say that they feel valued by me. At least, mm. but I know they say that because they say it in the three. You know, I could I can brick I can poof up the three sixty feedback. So I can confidently say I know what our staff at DSC would say about me because they tell me. Yeah, and they tell me as part of this process. Yeah, so yeah. Perfect. You think that's broadly right? I, I, I'm, I see a lot of myself in you, Deborah, and I see a lot of how you talk and about your communication style. And I'm making notes, being like, I should probably tell people yeah. that. And uh, I think my favourite one is you say, when people, if you come to me with a problem but you don't want it solving, please tell me that before you uh, you start giving me your problem. Otherwise, I'll be solving it five seconds in. <laughs> and I, I mean, for any of the listeners out there, if you, that is you, talk to people about that, address that. That is absolutely fine. And uh, sometimes people just want to vent, don't they? Yes, they do. And that's so true, actually. It's like, yeah, because I am a problem solver. So if you just if you just want me to listen, tell me. <laughs> and then I will listen. But if you yeah, if you don't want me to help, for God's sake, say please don't help me. I just want to whinge. And that's fine. I can live with that. <laughs> so uh, how, so think about what we know about you in work then. What's something about you that most people familiar with you wouldn't know? Is there any little insights you can give us into your life? I hate giving public speeches. I'm finding doing this really uncomfortable. No I'm quite a solitary person, really. I mean, my partner Andy would say to you how, you know, how how surprised people would find how how we live together. We live quietly. Mm. I don't really like going out that much. I'm not really a massive one for socially engaging or interacting. I'd much rather be sat on my own quietly reading a book or watching something on telly than I would be going to a party or hanging out with people. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't have like huge number of really close friends who I speak to all the time. My friends tend to be a little bit more distant. Mm. Yeah, that I'm you know, quite quiet, believe it or not. You know, I'm very quick to engage and interact when people talk to me, but my preference is to be quietly left alone. <laughs> so I suppose people find that quite surprising. So you say to be quiet, but you, you do have a four-legged friend who is the complete opposite of, of quiet. Oh, God, yes. If anybody yeah. follows, yes, if anybody follows Deborah on Twitter, she, you'll know about the, the chaos of Arthur. Um, but there's also a, a, another dog that played a big role in, in Charity Fair a number of years ago. Would you be able to tell the listeners about uh, one, of your, one of your older four-legged friends, Mabel? Sure. So Arthur's predecessor was a British bulldog called Mabel, who was the absolute love of my life. She was the nicest, sweetest, most placid dog you've ever come across in life. She could not have been more opposite to Arthur. You know, I used to, for various different personal circumstances, I had to bring Mabel in to work with me at DSC pretty much every day when I was in the office. And she was just like, she was so easygoing and placid. Nobody was scared of her. She just used to you know, even people who didn't like dogs weren't afraid of me, but they might not come near her, but they, you know, because she just was quiet and snuffled about and, you know, just nothing bothered her. Arthur completely did. I could never bring Arthur in for that because he did, he would destroy the place, you know, within seconds. But she she became a really familiar fixture in DSC to the extent where there was one particular year when we did charity fair when she'd become such a mascot for the organisation that they did a competition based around her. I think it was Guess Her Weight or something like that. I can't remember now. And they did a huge um, like poster with Mabel's yeah. face. I can't tell you where that was, actually. I should have kept it. I know. I wish we had it. I don't think we yeah, do. I wish we had it, yeah. Although Kate might still have the, the um, PDF. Kate's our designer, for those of you who are listening. She might still have the PDF of it. Um, yeah, and, so, and Mabel just like literally wandered around, sort of greeting the delegates and sort of shuffling about. So she was a special girl. She lived to be 13 years old, which is an amazing Bulldog. old age old dog. Yeah, Mabel. Yeah. What do you think your, your dogs bring to your life? Oh, my God. Well, I, so I was never able to have children. 
um, sadly. And that's that's one of the biggest sadnesses of my life. And so that kind of like, you know, the honest to the cliche is very true. It's like something to look after that isn't you and to care for. Yeah. So that's really helpful. But also, you know, the thing with a pet is it doesn't matter how down you are. They need feeding. They need walking. They demand attention. Like Arthur in particular will climb on my lap. You know, and it's like and no amount of me like feeling really depressed and miserable is going to stop that dog from climbing on my lap and then waiting to be loved. So I think they're incredibly good for your mental health. I mean, I wanted to start a campaign a few years ago, but, you know, pandemics and life got in the way. But about the fact that, you know, there are lots of people in this country, a very high proportion of them who can't have pets because they're living in rented accommodation or sheltered accommodation of some description and people are anti-pets. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, and that's, I think that's, there's, there's a massive amount of mental health issues that could be avoided or dealt with if we change the law so that the presumption is you have to allow families to have pets in order to be, you know, because there, and there's so much evidence out there actually that says that mm. people who have pets, generally speaking, have stronger and more effective mental health strategies than others. They're more likely to exercise, for example, because you've got, particularly if it's a dog, yeah. but also the fact that people who own pets tend to look after properties better, weirdly. Mm. Like the absolute opposite to what people counterintuitively say is like, you know, of course there are always the odd exceptions, but for the most yeah. part, so, yeah, at some point when I get the headspace and when, you know, we've steered ourselves and our sector through this pandemic, I will pick up that campaign again uh -huh. about, you know, pets, tenants absolutely being allowed pets and including in sheltered accommodation, in housing association accommodation, in That's state true. accommodation, in private rentage, you know, that there should be a presumption in law that you're allowed a pet unless there's a very, very good reason. That sounds like a brilliant idea and a brilliant cause to fight for. I think that would make big steps. And yeah, but in terms of mental health, there is correlation, isn't there? Between yeah, well, you've got Neil, of course, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, not quite. He doesn't like the walks like a dog does. But yeah, no, <laughs> Neil's my chameleon for everybody listening. Yeah, not quite as uh, as uh, big as Arthur, unfortunately. <laughs> Great. So um, in terms of your achievements then at DSC or the sector, so if either a DSC achievement or, or a charity sector achievement, what are, you, what are you most proud of over the last 20 years? Oh, wow. Um, gosh. I don't know. I can answer that question, George, is the honest truth, because there are so many things that, that the organisations achieve. I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, back in the days when we were set, threatened to be sued by lawyers because we were publishing details about trusts and foundations that we didn't back down and we kept publishing anyway. I think, that, I think that a lot of the messages around transparency in funding and, you know, who's got the money, who they give it to is as a result of our work. Absolutely. You know, so I'm really proud of that. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, the work, that we, our funding websites, for example, so the fact that, you know, there are charities out there that have been enabled to get money to support the people they serve because of the work that we do, because of our research team, team based back in the Liverpool office. I'm incredibly proud of the training services that we provide, which are, you know, typically really high quality. I mean, we don't always get it right, but mostly we do. I'm incredibly proud about how we responded to the pandemic and how everybody like stepped up and so quickly changed the way in which we deliver stuff. I mean, honestly, I couldn't say there's one single thing that I'm, I'm really proud of the publications that we produce, you know, so I couldn't, I, I, there's so much that we do at DSC that I'm incredibly proud of. I, I honestly couldn't pin it down. I really couldn't. I'm proud of the fact that we're so representative as an organization. We have, Almost forty percent of our staff identifies not white. Absolutely. You know, yeah. which is you know a quite a number of people identify as either non-binary, and some of them identify as you know asexual or bisexual. You know, it's like I feel we have a massive mix of religions and backgrounds and education, and you know, and I'm incredibly proud of that. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks. And a lot of that starts with the board, but it also starts with you, Jibber, and, and the conversations you have with staff and the thousand tellings, isn't it? We have to have these conversations as a leader and you really do that really well. And the amount of pressure you put on us to spend 
work time having casual conversations with our colleagues even to the point that my boss will ask me in a one-to-one have you been having catch-ups with people not about work really really push that and it's uh i mean i guess selfishly as a ceo that, that boosts creativity in an organization and engagement but still you still have to kind of trust people to not abuse that time when they, when they get that and you do that you you give us trust um so you mentioned the mental health campaign for the animals there uh, and of course you've achieved so much in your career is there anything other Anything else left that maybe you have a kind of a pressing desire to work on? Um, things emerge, to be honest, George. I mean, I never, I'm sort of, I tend to respond to opportunities, really. Yeah. So, um, I can't think of anything specific off the top of my head other than, you know, I'm really passionate about this pets for tenants thing, you know. I love it. Pets for tenants. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it's like things, I just want the world to be better. And there are various different ways in which people can do that. And there are people who fight for, Climate change, so people who fight for mental health. I just want charities to be able to do what they do really well, you know. And I want, I want the environment to be more respectful and honouring of them, which I just, don't, it just isn't at the moment. Mm. It's not, and it's not even that the public don't honour charities because they do. I and mean, public don't, public actually understand charities better than they think they do. But most, most of the public support local charities, not big ones, mm. and they don't equate, you know, big charities with little charities. So very often you ask them questions about what do they think about charities, they're not actually thinking about the charities they support. They're thinking about the big national charities, you know, yeah, dragged through the press. So. But I think this government's attitude to charities is disrespectful, this mm. particular government. Yeah. Well, not, not all of it. Well, so, yeah, this particular government, the people in government, as opposed to, you know, general MPs, because lots and lots of Conservative MPs absolutely understand the nature and value of the launch sector, but they definitely don't, you know, at cabinet minister level, for the most part, I would say. And where they do, like with our... Um, our minister, Diana Barron, who really does understand the sector, and she's a lovely woman, but yeah. she's in DCMS and has absolutely no power, no influence, no ability to get anything done because of the way things are currently structured. So, you know, yeah, so I would like to see that change. But I'm not sure whether those the, the minds of those people leading our government are changeable. I think yeah. we have to change those people, if I'm honest. Agreed. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, we will see. Perfect. So before I ask you one last question, is there anything else you wanted to say to our listeners about your career? Um, I've just always been open to opportunities. Mm. Basically, I've always like, I'm a volunteer. I would, you know, I would never say I haven't got time or it's not my job. Nice. You know, I'm always the first person to volunteer, to help to do a project, to help organise a party, to you know, yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's one of the ways to success is, is be a volunteer for stuff don't hide behind your job you know you can you can manage your time and do extra stuff if you if you really want to do that thing and also the, the importance of being a radiator not a drain <laughs> you know, I'm a radiator I, I like to think that when I talk to people we have fun or it's mm. interesting or you know people feel they're valued I, I hope that nobody comes away from a conversation with me feeling like oh my god I'm just so depressed I'll, you know what I mean and yet you know so I'd ask yourself listeners would people describe you as a radiator or a drain and which would you rather be you know and if you would rather be a radiator than a drain then do the things that make people feel good about being in your company I like that be a radiator not a drain I've just written that down great so how do people connect with you Deborah? how do they learn more about you through Twitter and things like that well, they can follow me on Twitter at Deborah Crock Tyler. I share a lot of my thoughts and information and talk a lot about DSC. They can email me. You know, I'm yep. very open to be contacted by people. So Crock Tyler at dsc.org.uk. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I use LinkedIn, but I'm not brilliant on LinkedIn. You know, and I'm not very good at Instagram because I like words and Instagram's more pictures, you know, and I prefer to paint pictures with my words than I do photos. So, yeah, things like that. Contacting DSC generally. Mm-hmm. You can get in touch with me that way. And you do a regular blog as well, Third Sector? Nope. I don't do blogs, George. I write articles. She said being super pedantic, but it's true. (laughs) So I do. I'm a columnist, a regular columnist for Third Sector magazine. For those of you who subscribe to it, there's a print copy in the online stuff, so you can find me through there. And also, of course, I also write articles for our own DSC and books, of course. I've also written... I've written 10 books altogether in my career, but four specifically for DSC. And actually, the thing about my books, um, all the money goes to the charity. So I don't make a penny out of it. So if any of you are going off to buy one of my books, you can do so knowing I, I don't personally financially benefit. It all goes to the charity. So, yeah. 
Perfect. So thank you so much for answering our questions and, be, and being so honest there and really sharing some really honest stories, Deborah. I, I know our listeners will really appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much. So this has been the first podcast from DSC, the first Charity Questions podcast, uh, and our guest, Deborah Alcock-Tyler. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. It was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you for watching Charity Questions by the Directory of Social Change. So if you want to get involved, please check out the Directory of Social Change on Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn. And of course, to hear more about this content and to learn more about Charity Questions, subscribe to our YouTube channel now. And of course, like this video to let us know if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Cheers.